Today, uh, if you would look on the calendar, it would be called Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday was that Sunday when Jesus' appointed time had come. He had poured his life into the disciples for three years. He had taught them publicly. He had taught them privately. He saw them fail. He saw them grow. He saw them grow in their faith. And now it was time to go to the cross and fulfill the purpose that he was sent here to do for his God and his Father. Uh, Father. And so it's there that we see that he went into Jerusalem and there was, it was a celebration time. Uh, the palms were things that, in the branches that they would lay in the streets and they would throw their uh, clothes and their coats there. And it was as if kind of like what we would call a parade. But it wasn't one of entertainment. It was one of introduction. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has come to give his life a ransom for everybody. And as that week went on, everything started to change. The mood started to change. People, uh, the Jewish leaders, had for months and months wanted to see Jesus die. He was a threat to their religion. He was a threat to their belief system. And so all this came according to God's holy will. And then we call this week Passion Week. And I pray that sometime this week, you will go look at the Gospels and you will read that last week of Jesus' life and all that went on there. But there's one thing I want you to know. There's no doubt in my mind, Jesus loves everyone and God loves everyone. And today I want you to see Calvary's love. If you have a bulletin and you're following along and want to take notes, Calvary's love is the title of our message. And I have three points I want to make. Number one, Jesus loves unconditionally. Unconditionally. See, man's love has a lot of conditions to it. I'll love you if you love me. I'll be nice to you if you'll be nice to me. But folks, they were anything but nice to Jesus Christ. And all he showed them was unconditional love. Number two, Jesus loved equally. He doesn't love certain people more than others. He loved everyone at the cross. He died for everyone at the cross. And number three, Jesus loves sacrificially. He gave of himself. He gave of himself. And it's that agape love. It's that willing to die for someone's love. And when you think about that last 72 hours of Jesus' life and what he went through, there were three trials and, you know, they had false witnesses and they lied and all this going on, just bouncing him him back from Pilate and and Herod and, uh, you know, also, you know, with the, the beating that he took, the scourging, I hope you understand that people died from the Roman scourging. They would have a whip, and on that leather they would have bones, and they would have rocks. And when he was taking a beating, uh, his, his flesh, part of his back, was literally coming off him. And a lot of prisoners died from the beating or bleeding to death. But yet he went through all that. He was spit on. He was called names. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And I can truly say, folks, no one has went through the beating that Jesus Christ went through by those Roman soldiers. So with this in mind, let's look at the last part of the crucifixion. They had nailed spikes into his hands. They had nailed spikes into his feet. He was up in public. There were thousands of people there. They had stripped him to where he barely had any clothes on. And he was standing and he was on the cross and a lot of, a lot of times the death would be because they couldn't breathe anymore. They literally had to push up with their toes to be able to breathe. And so we see all that Jesus went through. 
And in Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 32, look at Jesus' unconditional love. There was also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. These criminals had probably robbed somebody. Because they were being crucified, there was prob probably a murder. There was probably a death in these sentences. So Jesus was put between two thieves. And when they come to the place called Calvary, they crucified him and the criminals. And when we look at Calvary, another word for it is Golgotha. And, and in there, there was a couple of uh, ideas about that. Some said the rock below the cross formed as a skull. And we know what a skull means. It means someone had to die. There was a death. And another thing it meant as far as uh, it, it also was a picture of death. When you came to that place, when you were being crucified and punished, you were going to die. And so we see that. He came to Calvary. He was crucified, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, and folks, I still have, a, have trouble wrapping my mind around this statement from the cross. Knowing what had been done to him by the soldiers. Knowing the court of law and all that he had went through. There was no justice in this. Jesus was an innocent man. Jesus had never sinned. Jesus just loved people. And his love for people was unconditional. He loved the men that drove those spikes in his hand. He loved those men that beat him with that whip. His love was unconditional because of this statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, folks, people hurt us. People say ugly things to us. People try to hurt us in times. And when I think of what Jesus went through, folks, I need to forgive others also. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And that's what Jesus did. He loved everyone unconditionally. And He forgave people from the cross. In His hardest, the most cruel moment, the most painful moment of his life, he makes this statement. And folks, I am telling you, we as Christians need to learn to forgive others and love others the way Jesus loves others. And the Bible says, and they divided his garments and cast lots. And again, this was just a fulfillment of prophecy. You can go back to Psalms 22 in the Old Testament and see all that was going on. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered and said, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And folks, that was the problem with the Jewish nation. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They did not believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. They did not believe that Jesus came to die for their sins. And so they treated him as a thief. They treated him as a criminal. They did not respect his life and his walk and his words. And then they do the ultimate thing saying, hey, why don't he save himself if he is the Messiah? Well, folks, I can give you an answer to that. If he came down off the cross we could not be saved today. He stayed there for you and for, I, for me. He loved us unconditionally. The soldiers also mocked Him, coming and offering Him sour wine. And some may think that is a, a, a thing of mercy, but as I studied this this week, it was a cheap wine. It was something you know, that, that poor people would have which again is almost making fun of Jesus. And, I, and all through this, 
you know, he, he did not get any respect. They did not treat him like he should have been treated. And they, they just, they, they made fun of him. They, they called him names. They said, uh, you know, come down off the cross and save yourself. And in verse 38, an inscription also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. Even though it was written up there above him. And of course, the crime on a cross was written above their head of what they were guilty of. And folks, he did not come to overthrow the government. He did not come to, to set up an earthly kingdom. He came for you and I. He came because he loved you and I. He spent 33 years here because of you and I. There's room at the cross for you. Jesus came to die for you, and His love was unconditional. John 15, John 15, verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this. He's saying, this is the greatest love. This is written in red. This is Jesus' word. Greater love no, has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Oh, folks, Jesus loves you. He loves you deeply. He loves you eternally. He loves you so much that He willingly gave His life for you and me. And folks, I thank God for Jesus' unconditional love. The second thing I want you to see on Calvary's love is not only Jesus' Jesus' love is unconditional, Jesus' love is equal. It is equal. Look at verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. Folks, that's a strong word. Blaspheme simply means it's more than made fun of him. Okay? It's almost cursing him almost hating him, almost being mad at him, okay? It was out of scorn, okay? Blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Well, I got news for you, folks. He is the Christ. But this thief was only concerned about himself. And folks, that is a problem in our society today. We have this me mentality. It is all about me. Folks, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's about a relationship with God. It's about knowing God. It's about accepting Jesus into your life. Understanding that He loves everyone equal. The children see Him red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what you have on. It doesn't matter how much you have or what you drive or even who you are. Jesus loves you. He went to the cross for you. And folks, we need to understand everyone everywhere needs Christ. Folks, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And He loves us all. Then verse 40, and the other answered, rebuked Him, saying. See, there was two two thieves there. One was looking out for himself. The other saw Jesus for who He is. See, they watched Jesus been beat, beaten. They watched Him carry His cross and falling and having help carrying that. They watched Him nailed to the cross. And both of them saw this in first person. Both of them witnessed what was happening to Jesus. Both saw the hate and the making fun of in their lives, but they had two totally different opinions 
about what was happening. The first basically rebuked him, and the first one cursed him. But this, this thief, I'm telling you, Jesus' life, Jesus' reactions, Jesus' word penetrated his heart. It penetrated his heart. And then he rebukes him in verse 40. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? He said, we did this. We're guilty. This man has done nothing. He has done nothing. Verse 41, and we indeed justly, for we receive due reward of our deeds. We deserve what we're getting. But he has done nothing. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, and here's the key word, Lord. He saw Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He made a statement of faith. He did. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was he saying? Jesus, I believe what you're saying is true. I saw how you've reacted. I see how much you love us. I believe. I believe. Would you please have mercy on me? Would you please just allow me to go into your kingdom? And folks, I believe with all my heart, this man found salvation on his deathbed. And folks, he didn't have time to come off a cross. He didn't have time to follow his Lord in baptism. He was fixing to die. But yet, notice Jesus' reaction in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, you know what that means? Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, folks. Jesus loved that man that was blaspheming him. Jesus loved this man, this thief. And one reacted in a negative way. The other reacted in a positive way. But Jesus loved them both equally. This one thief could have been saved. But he did not believe. He was only looking out for himself. And it's, it's a sad thing, folks, but according to the Word of God, He died and He will spend eternity in hell according to the Word. But this man believed and he said, today, today, you're going to heaven with me. Romans 10, verse 13. Romans 10, 13, look at this. For whoever, what does whoever mean? That's everybody, folks. It doesn't mean everyone will be saved. Everyone has to make their own choice. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is for everyone. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. I want you to see this. And we are in Revelation and we are anticipating the rapture of the church and many are saying, why hasn't he come yet? Well, here's why he hasn't come yet, okay? Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. <clears throat> Excuse me, what was his promise? In John chapter 14, I, I am going away, but I will come again. And it says, but is long-suffering. He is patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Why hasn't he come? Because there are still people that need to be saved. Why hasn't he come? Because, because there are still people that need to know the love of Jesus Christ. And folks, Jesus loves us equally. Jesus loves everyone. And salvation is a free gift from God. So we see Jesus loves us unconditionally. He loves us equally. And last thing, Jesus loves sacrificially. Sacrificially. Look at verse 44. 
Now it was about the sixth hour, which would have been noon, and there was darkness all over the earth till the ninth hour. And you always have to ask yourself, why darkness? And what does darkness represent? In the Word of God, it represents Satan, and it represents evil forces. And here, the Son of God was hanging on a tree. And here, an innocent man was going to die for the sins of the world. And God, and, and notice, it, and it's what I said before, folks. Look at every word in the Bible. Look at every word in every verse. And there was darkness over all the earth. It just wasn't, you know, there at Calvary. All of the earth. And some, some people uh, try to say, well, it might have been a lunar eclipse or something. And folks, we know the difference between a darkness and an eclipse. Even in that day, uh, uh, historically, uh, there was a full moon out during that day, uh, history folks have even said. So that darkness, it wasn't trying to hide Jesus. It was saying the weight of sin was on Jesus. The weight of sin. And folks, I hope you understand what was going on in Jesus' life. Okay? He was about to take his last breath. He was about to feel something he had never felt before. Why? Because he was the perfect son of God. And folks, I've, I've had a few people, not very many, question that Jesus was perfect. But folks, you have to go back to his birth. Joseph was not his biological father. We believe Jesus was sent. He was sent by God. He was sent through the Holy Spirit. And he was placed in Mary's womb. And that's why he did not have a sin nature. You and I are born with a sin nature. Why? Because we have a biological father and a biological mother. And in sin, we were created. You don't have to teach a toddler to sin. They will do it on their own. Just tell them not to do something. But Jesus was different, folks. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was perfect. And I am telling you, He died perfect for you and I. Verse 45, Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And we know what this means, folks. There were animal sacrifices all through the Old Testament. They would come on the day of atonement and the high priest would give a sacrifice for their sins and it would roll them back for one year and lambs, you know, thousands of thousands and millions over the years of lambs died. Their blood was poured out and that was the way to satisfy God. But the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world died on a cross once and for all. We don't have to have animal sacrifices anymore. We can go straight to the throne of God and tell Him God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me for what I have done. Well, folks, we serve a personal God. We serve a personal Jesus. And we go to Him in prayer. The veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit My Spirit. Well, folks, I hope you understand. He willingly died for you and I. He did not die a martyr's death, folks. He freely gave His life for you and I. And He said right there, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I've done this for 33 years. I want to get back to you. I want to get back to that perfect place. I want to see you face to face. God, take my spirit, and let's go. He died for you and I. He gave His life for you and I. His life paid for our sins. Folks, you can't clean up enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't get baptized enough times. You can't work hard enough to go to heaven. 
You come through the blood of Jesus Christ according to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 5. Folks, you have to understand this verse. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For He, God, notice the capitalization, that is deity. For He, God, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. The very thing that never had been in Jesus' life. 33 years, He never sinned. He became sin for you and I. Think of the vilest sin that you can think of. Think of some of the things that mankind has done. Folks, He died for that sin. He became sin for you and I. Why? Because He loved us sacrificially. He would rather die for us He would rather die for us. That was the most important thing in his life. That was his purpose in life. That's why he came. That's why we celebrate his life and his resurrection. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Folks, the only way I can be right with God is to come through the cross, to come through Jesus, to ask forgiveness of my sins to repent of my sins, to invite Jesus to come into my life. And when that was laid on Jesus, He died and went back to heaven. In verse, in the rest of that, having said this, He breathed His last. All folks, His body died that day on Calvary. His body no longer had life in Him. But I am telling you, His soul and spirit was alive and is alive forevermore. So when the centurion saw what he had happened, what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Folks, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, folks, he is a righteous man. He came down as man, 100% man. He felt it when they pulled at his beard. He felt that crown of thorn on his head. But he was not only 100% man, he was 100% God. And he willingly gave his life for you and I. Have you noticed at the cross, there were two men that found Jesus? There was a thief who was condemned to die. There was a soldier that had probably been in on some of the things they did to Jesus. But both of them acknowledged Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and both of them found Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Has there been a time in your life that you have repented of your sins and you have called on the name of the Lord and you have asked Him to forgive you of your sins and you have given your whole heart and your life to Jesus Christ? As a minister of the Gospel today, I am telling you, there's room at the cross for you. And the greatest decision that you could make today is to accept Jesus Christ into your life. To put your total trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because He loves you unconditionally. Because He loves you equally. And because He loves you sacrificially. Father, thank You for this day. And God, I thank You for Calvary's love. And God, I thank You that Jesus gave His life for everyone, God. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know You, God, I pray today would be the day of salvation. God, I pray that they would just come forward and 
just say, I need to be saved today. I need Jesus today. And God, I pray also for the Christian. God, I pray that they would just stop right now and just focus on the cross. God, I pray that they would look at their own life. And God, I know none of us are worthy of the Lord's Supper. That's not what it says. It says we need to be ready for the Lord's Supper. We need to confess our sins. We need to do an introspection. We need to look at our lives. And God, we need to get right with you. So God, I pray that you would touch Christians' hearts. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move during this time of invitation. God, this is your church. This is your time. This is the Holy Spirit. So God, speak to us. Speak to us through the Holy Spirit. And God, if there's one here that needs to follow the Lord in baptism or wants to join the church, I pray that they would do that also. So God, we love you. We thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?